Um, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I've been asked to present to you uh, the case that tall buildings can contribute to the creation of livable places. Uh, and I'll be presenting to you two of the key areas that demonstrate that uh, building a height is not only desirable but necessary. Um, firstly, that the quality of life available from living in high rise urban environment is vastly superior to the alternative. And secondly, that the building the, the building tool will impact not only our city but our whole country and in a far more meaningful way than our opinion of how pretty the London skyline is or isn't. Now, you may have been expecting me to stand here and extol the virtues of our buildings, uh, but I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Um, we've recently, we have repeatedly failed to build successfully at height, with catastrophic impacts to family life, community, crime, and even the old Jaguar. Ultimately, we have failed to build for livability. And just think of the, of the likes of the Ellsbury Estate. I want you to listen to this debate and try to think not only of our historical, our historically miserable attempts to build a height in the UK, but of the importance of what tall buildings can achieve in protecting and enhancing what is great about London. Few cities in the world have more skyscrapers than Vancouver, yet it is consistently ranked among the most livable places in the world. For me, this is the clearest example that whilst the vast majority of tall buildings we experience do not contribute to the creating of the, to creating livable places. Believe me, they certainly can. One of the most cited reasons for the success of Vancouver, and many tall buildings, tall cities besides, is that the city has remained at a human scale. It sounds ridiculous, I know, that a city full of buildings hundreds of metres high is at a human scale, but it is. Contrast this to the likes of LA, where massive highways funnel everyone in from gigantic suburbs. In Vancouver, you can walk just about anywhere you might want to go. One of the main attributes for quality of life, and therefore livability, is how accessible the goods, services, and the community we wish to be part of are. And I, for one, relish the idea of being able to get to work, to my friends, and to the unrivaled cultural highlights of my city as easily as our Canadian cousins. Through experience, we have identified how to build to enhance quality of life. We are not talking about the developments of post-war slum areas, which robs people of both private and shared space. We have a plethora of regulations that ensure homes are of a decent size, have access to suitable amenities and space, as well as maintaining our city's own fabric. We in the UK have got used to such poor service models. I seem to go to so many apartment blocks where the developer's idea of service provision is to provide a balance. And the reason is because providing meaningful, meaningful service is expensive. But when you have 100, 200, or even 500 homes in a single building, single building, it enables the kind of living that we would only ever associate with the very best hotels. I'm talking about fantastic lobby. An attendant who knows your name and can introduce you to other people in the building. We may offer a coffee shop for you. There may be a coffee shop, a big dining room that you can host a real party despite living in a one bedroom flat, and a immaculately kept roof garden. I could go on and on. But these are the norm in a city like Vancouver, and they cost next to nothing because they're shared by so many. Now, as the population of London continues to grow, we face the very real challenge of local inhabitants being driven out of from their neighbourhoods that they have lived in for generations. And if we're going to fight to keep these communities together, we have to make land we have work harder. In my opinion, it is simply unacceptable that people on low wages should be forced to live far away from not only their family and friends, but also their jobs. Any additional time spent commuting is wasted time, and the costs are enormous. Not only does the individual, not only to the individual, who may be forced to live so far from their employment due to the high rents, but it costs every one of us. Who even pays for the sprawling network of transport that has to connect people being forced to live further and further in city centres? Who do we really, and do we really believe that we can provide better services and amenity to a disparate urban community? Surely we, we can offer Londoners a greater sense of belonging to our city by keeping them close to its centre and all that is great about it. Now I hate to speculate, but I venture that you will hear from Laura and Steve some of, that it is possible to build density without one that it can be achieved because we are able to build these same densities in compact, low-rise development. And it's 100% true. But it's only possible at a critical scale of development. 
And though they are hugely important, we simply cannot rely on these mega development sites to deliver the 400,000 homes that London requires over the next decade. Mega development opportunities such as King's Cross or Earl's Court are few and far between, and we have to fit into the existing urban ground. I would hope that all of us are averse to letting the city sprawl further and further into the countryside, unless it is absolutely necessary. And when there are hundreds of acres of brownfield sites available in London, we just have to be able to make these schemes viable. The cost of developing on former industrial land is so much higher. Ground contamination and poor transport connectivity means that construction costs are high and values are low. The development of Nine Elms from an industrial semi wasteland into a livable place would not have been possible without the density that is being delivered. Allowing for developers to pay, <laughs> allowing for developers to pay the millions necessary to improve transport and repair the site of the building. Now I strongly believe that we have to make the land that already exists in the middle of our urban landscape work hard before we risk sprawling further into the pristine green of the sites. I believe that we are lucky enough to have some of the best countryside in the world in this country. And in 1935 we took the decision to protect it from the sprawling urban environment with the green belt. Though I rather hope we don't, any of you who could get up right now would be in rolling hills in 30 minutes. I think we forget how special that is. Building tool enables to protect the most valuable and irreplaceable livable assets that we have, the natural environment. Viability is achieved vertically, allowing for the horizontal plane, the one which we operate, to be free for uses to give us additional pleasure. By achieving density through height, we free up land within the cities themselves for open space. I'm not talking about horrific, vast, intimidating parts of Brazil, but green space on the urban scale. It's not to say that tall buildings strip away any form of private outdoor space. The Vancouver model of podiums and stacks, shown on the previous slide, provides ample space for the provision of shared private space, a concept taken further, shown here, by the Marina Bay Sands building, where a semi private park has been invented hundreds of years since the air within the space of city of Singapore. In the UK, we have an unbelievably poor record of building at height, and I think many of us have had our opinions strongly affected by the failures of the past. But there are two enormous changes. Firstly, our understanding of livability and the technology we now have available to build livable places. We can create far greater quality urban living for people living in tall buildings in the middle of cities than for those forced to live miles from friends, family, and jobs. And secondly, the immense population pressures that we already experience mean that we only really have two choices, build up or build out. We have to make the land already within our cities work far, far harder before we let any more of the precious countryside become a concrete jungle. Had you asked me, do tall buildings contribute to livable places? I would probably be sitting squarely between my pens. But I strongly believe that we, when we consider the alternatives and put to use the vast experience we've accrued, tall buildings offer the creation of a far more livable place.